Well, hello there. Do we have a story for you? But before we begin, please pause this video and take a moment to subscribe to our website so that if we are deplatformed from here, you can continue to watch our videos from there. Head to artistasfamily.is and click on the subscribe tab. We are forever being told COVID vaccines work. They protect vulnerable communities and they are safe. So in this video, we thought we'd examine these three claims more closely. The editor of the British Medical Journal, Associate Professor Peter Doshi, speaking at a Senate hearing in Washington, DC, shares our concern about the dogmatic certainty and unscientific nature of current COVID discourse. I'm Peter Doshi for identification purposes. I'm on the faculty at the University of Maryland and editor at the BMJ. I have no relevant conflicts of interest and my comments today are my own. In pharmacy school, I teach a required course on how to critically appraise the medical literature. We train students on how to go beyond a study abstract and start to pick apart and critically assess biomedical studies, not just take them at face value. I'm saddened that we are super saturated as a society right now in the attitude of everybody knows that has shut down intellectual curiosity and led to self-censorship. In our recent video, How Do You Solve a Problem Like the Unvaccinated, we revealed just a little of where the money flows between media, corporations, corporatized governments, and corporate-sponsored scientific or health institutions. The political rhetoric from politicians and the corporate media echoes the systemic infiltration on a daily basis. Dr. Doshi speaks to this corruption of science by corporatized politics. Everybody knows that this is a pandemic of the unvaccinated. But if hospitalizations and deaths were almost exclusively occurring in the unvaccinated, why would booster shots be necessary? Vaccinologist Professor Nikolai Petrovsky from Flinders University in South Australia has developed a protein-based COVID vaccine. And as he's first to point out, he has a conflict of interest in this story. He says there is no evidence that the pandemic is being spread by the unvaccinated. And he states that the current crop of mRNA COVID vaccines are not stopping community transmission. So the vaccine is protecting the individual. There is no evidence whatsoever at this stage that COVID-19 vaccines are protecting the community. And that's where it's flawed. Unless you have that evidence, that the vaccine is blocking transmission to everyone else, then it's a fallacy to imply that forcing you to get vaccinated is somehow beneficial to the community when there is no evidence for that. We have heard so many people say that they are rolling up their sleeves for vulnerable people. And certainly that has been the strong messaging from corporatized government and media. Dr. Doshi offers a very different story. There's something not adding up and we should all be asking, is it true that this is a pandemic of the unvaccinated? What does that even mean? Everybody knows that COVID vaccines save lives. In fact, we've known this from early 2021, the clinical trials proved that to be the case. As you can see here in the quote of a February article in the Journal of the American Medical Association. But is it true? When that statement by prominent public health officials was penned, there had been just one death, one death, across the 70,000 Pfizer and Moderna trial participants. Today we have more data, and you can see that there were similar numbers of deaths in the vaccine and placebo groups. The trials did not show a reduction in death. Even for COVID deaths, as opposed to other causes, the evidence is flimsy with just two deaths in the placebo group versus one in the vaccine group. My point is not that I know the truth about what the vaccine can and cannot do. My point is that those who claimed the trials showed the vaccines were highly effective in saving lives were wrong. The trials did not demonstrate this. Dr. Doshi, like a growing cohort of medical scientists, is questioning whether mRNA inoculants should even be considered vaccines. I am one of the academics that argues that these mRNA products, which everybody calls vaccines, are qualitatively different than standard vaccines. 
And so I found it fascinating to learn that Merriam-Webster changed its definition of vaccine early this year. mRNA products did not meet the definition of vaccine that has been in place for 15 years at Merriam-Webster, but the definition was expanded such that mRNA products are now vaccines. I highlight this to ask a question. How would you feel about mandating COVID vaccines if we didn't call them vaccines? What if these injections were called drugs instead? So here's the scenario. We have this drug, and we have evidence that it doesn't prevent infection, nor does it stop viral transmission. But the drug is understood to reduce your risk of becoming very sick and dying of COVID. Would you take a dose of this drug every six months or so for possibly the rest of your life, if that's what it took for the drug to stay effective? Would you not just take this drug yourself, but support regulations mandating that everybody else around you take this drug? Have we been sold another red herring? Harvard-trained doctor Adam Urato writes in the Indian Journal of Medical Ethics, the problem with respect to the COVID-19 pandemic is that now much of the public doesn't trust the CDC, the FDA, or the entire medical system at all. Who would trust a system that is so heavily industry funded, whose primary goal is Wall Street profits? The public wants major public health institutions that are free from pharma influence. Absolutely. Medicines Australia, a major public health institution, justifies the infiltration of pharma like this. Pharmaceutical companies support the enhancement of medical knowledge and the quality use of medicines through sponsoring independently organized educational activities. These educational activities are primarily offered by learned societies, colleges, universities, and other recognized healthcare professional organizations. Medicines Australia freely publish documents showing the reach and monies paid by the pharmaceutical industry each year. This particular document shows that in just six months of last year, Pfizer contributed almost half a million dollars towards various Australian medical symposiums and events, reaching over 14,000 doctors, students and nurses. In her recent post, COVID-19 vaccine benefits exaggerated, say experts, the Australian science journalist, Dr. Marianne DeMarcy, outlined one probable route for mRNA vaccine trial deception. It is well established that only quoting relative risk reduction or RRR without quoting the absolute risk reduction or ARR can inflate or exaggerate an intervention's effect size and clinical importance as well as increase people's willingness to receive the treatment. It has been referred to as the first sin against transparent communication by Gerd Gigerenza, director of the Harding Center for Risk Literacy at the Max Planck Institute. He says it can be used as a deliberate tactic to manipulate or persuade people. A new study from Sweden reveals that spike protein from mRNA vaccines enter cells and potentially impair DNA damage repair in the nucleus, the author states. Our findings reveal a potential molecular mechanism by which the spike protein might impede adaptive immunity and underscore the potential side effects of full-length spike-based vaccines. The repercussions for this are vast, and we'll dive into this research in a future video as more comes to light. But for now, we want to know why is there so much confidence in spike-based mRNA technology that has never before been used? As Dr. DeMasi points out, notably when quoting the vaccine's harms, authorities will use the smaller percentage absolute risk reduction or ARR, presumably to minimize public concern about adverse events. So if Professor Petrovsky and Dr. Doshi are right in saying novel mRNA inoculants produce no synthetic herd immunity to block transmission and therefore do little to protect vulnerable communities, and these inoculants or drugs in a syringe offer only perhaps a small benefit to the individual, are the adverse reactions and deaths caused by these therapeutics societally worthwhile? Just a quick aside from the WHO. Each year, almost 18 million people die globally from cardiovascular disease related to poor diet, cigarettes, and alcohol. Thus, 
In the two years since COVID began, nearly 36 million people have died from what is a pandemic of junk substances. In Victoria, where people have endured the longest lockdowns on the planet, the state government closed children's playgrounds but kept open bottle shops, fast food outlets and places where cigarettes are sold. Compare almost 36 million cardiovascular disease deaths to 5 million COVID deaths over the same period. Are governments really interested in the health of people? A former American endurance mountain biker named Kyle shared his story of vaccine injury with Dr. John Campbell recently. Before his Pfizer vaccine, Kyle could ride in mountain bike competitions for around six to eight hours a day. Now he can barely do 15 minutes of exercise before his heart rate jumps to 140 beats per minute. Kyle has been diagnosed with pericarditis, which in simple terms is inflammation surrounding the heart. Like many with COVID vaccine injuries, he's fighting for his story to be heard. Kyle was invited to speak in Washington, D.C. with a cohort of vaccine-injured people. I got to go to Washington, D.C. and be a part of this panel. And so there was around 20 people that spoke, and a senator named Senator Johnson organized the panel. So, so this, this is testifying 10. to Senate, isn't it? Yeah, testifying yeah. to Senate. And Senator Johnson personally invited, you know, Anthony Fauci, the head of the NIH, head of the CDC, the head of the FDA, the CEO of Pfizer, the CEO of Moderna, and all the state representatives of the vaccine injured that were speaking out. So like for me, that would be Idaho. And there were several, I think there was around 10 vaccine injured people speaking out and then 10 doctors and scientists. And it was frustrating because, you know, we were all very hopeful that we can maybe have a good conversation and, and hash this out a little bit. Um, but yeah, none of the people invited showed up. We've been told it's safe and effective. We're trying to do our part and then this happens. And then it's, where do you go from there? How do you get treatment? And yeah, it was just sad that no one even felt the need to show up or send a representative to listen to these stories. And it kind of showed me a lot. And the other thing that I thought was interesting is, you know, Washington, D.C. as a whole has a very strict mask mandate everywhere you go. And so we we're all at the hotel room. You know, everyone gets down to the main lobby. Everyone has their masks on. We get on the bus. They load all the wheelchairs up because there's four people in wheelchairs. We go over to the Capitol. And as soon as we get to the Capitol, I realized that, like, the security guard didn't have a mask on. And I was like, hey, this might be a super dumb question, but do we need to wear masks in here? And they go, no, anything in the Capitol and Senate building, there's no mask mandate. You can do whatever you want. It just kind of opened my eyes even more. And then to see them not show up and there's this table with all their names, you know, Fauci and NIH director, CDC director, all these people, empty table with their placards there with their names on it. And you're just like, okay, this is the problem that we're having right now is that people aren't having honest conversation. They didn't even send junior officials. No No one at all. Like no one, zero. Zero people. And the only news outlets that actually showed up and kind of reported on it were the independent news outlets, which are usually more more conservative based. But there wasn't like an NPR. There wasn't anyone there that wanted to just listen and say, hey, what's going on? It was just like Newsmax and a few different Christian news channels. And that was it. You have all these different vaccines and they're kind of manifesting in heart issues and they're manifesting in like this transverse myelitis problem, which four people had at this panel you would think they would want to at least kind of investigate, you know, and listen and say, hey, what is happening? Why, why is this happening? We share this frustration too, Kyle. So much of our time these days is spent making videos like this because there is a chronic absence of unbiased critical analysis in Australia. Anything that deviates from the corporate scientific narrative is immediately exiled from the standard news channels and labelled Trumpist, right wing or conspiracy. It's deeply concerning and helps pave the way for more flagrant authoritarianism from governments while closing down scientific debate. For an example, let's return to the kind of science that is being blocked from the standard corporate news channels at the moment. So it all comes down to the R naught, the transmissibility of a virus. Right. Um, and so if we have a virus that has an R naught that's just above one, so, yes. you know, then we know that all we need to do is get the R0 below one and the virus will die out, right? right? Because it means that you have to have at least one person infected by each person who's infected for the virus to keep propagating. Yes. So certainly if if COVID had an R0 of 1.2 and a vaccine even had a slightest impact on the risk of transmission, Right, which for which there is you know evidence that there's a, a very weak effect on transmission, then then in fact, yes, it could have an impact. 
The problem we're dealing with is that Delta has an R naught that's somewhere between six and eight. Wow. So for every person infected, right, you, they're going to infect six to eight other people. So a vaccine that reduces the transmissibility of the virus by, say, 20% is going to take that, you know, R naught of six and it may get it down to five. So now instead of a person infecting six people, they're going to infect five people. Well, exponential growth where each person's infecting five people is, is going to look no different to if they were infected in six people. So, right. so that's right. why it becomes a fallacy when you deal with a specific problem such as the Delta variant. So we know in countries that are way ahead of Australia, you know, that have 90% vaccination coverage, yeah. they're still having major outbreaks. The minute that they remove social isolation, they remove masks, you know, they, they go yeah. try to go back to normal. They've been hit with major waves of disease. Their hospitals are filled up. They start to see deaths again. So, you know, again, it's not that Australia are discovering this sort of somehow we unique to the rest of the world. Other countries are already there. And, right. and what they've realised is, even with exceptionally high vaccination rates, vaccination by itself, will not be enough to make life go back to normal. The other major issue that isn't discussed is just how fast the protection wears off. We now recognise, you know, from data with the mRNA vaccines, which have been used exclusively in Israel, we have very nice data showing after four months that any protection against actual infection is all gone. Four months after having your two doses. Um, which is why in Israel they've now given everyone a third dose. Um, yep. Is that going to be enough? Well, it's it's too early to tell. But, you know, that's extremely rapidly waning immunity. And right. that means those people four months after having had their mRNA vaccines, you know, there is no effect that we know of on transmissibility because if their rate of infection now is the same as people who are not vaccinated, and the level of virus when you test them when they're positive is the same as someone who hasn't been vaccinated. Right. On what basis are you arguing that that, that in itself is going to, to allow life to get back to normal? It's not. Vaccine injuries and death are rare. At least that is the story being reported. We keep hearing this kind of messaging. So if the vaccine is safe, why is it still under clinical trials? That's not because researchers are worried about potential side effects further down the track. It's been a year and a half since people received their shots in the Pfizer clinical trial. None of them have had side effects pop up later. I thought it was also interesting at that DC meeting, there was two people, Maddie, who is a 12 year old in the clinical trial for Pfizer. She was dropped after her injury. And so she didn't count towards the data in that trial. And then Brienne, who's actually the one who organized the React 19 group, she was in the AstraZeneca uh, clinical trial, and she had an adverse reaction after the first dose. But to complete the trial, you had to have both doses. So she counted as a withdrawal. This is how the TGA in Australia responded after a British medical journal's investigation revealed falsified data and an unwillingness to look into adverse reactions. The Therapeutic Goods Administration has stressed that Pfizer's vaccine is highly safe and effective and that Australians should not be concerned about the issues raised in the article. It is interesting that the TGA's regulatory activity is funded by a system of cost recovery or user pays. Therefore, the TGA, like the CDC and the FDA in the United States, is significantly funded by the pharmaceutical industry and other developers and manufacturers of therapeutic goods. We cannot underestimate the reach of corporate infiltration into every layer of government, the media and science. For years now, we have been using the terms shareholder science or industry science to make a clear distinction between corporatized and independent sciences. The general lack of transparency and debate in COVID-19 narratives, especially relating to mRNA or spike-based vaccines, is just a symptom of a far greater societal malaise. When corporate lobbyists get into every vein of public life, you can bet that it is your money, not your health, that's at the forefront of their motivations. Well, that's the update for this week. 
We aim to keep producing these weekly videos by hook or by crook. If you'd like to help support our work, please head to our website and click on the support tab. Thanks for tuning in.